If an athlete uses performance-enhancing drugs during competition, they get banned for four years. Seems reasonable to me. You get caught, you get a punishment, I mean, not competing for four years, that's quite a lot, and then you get a second chance. The problem here is that committing a crime in sports cannot be directly compared to committing a crime in real life, like for example, robbing a bank. Why is that? Because a physiological effect on the body by taking performance-enhancing drugs might be long-lasting. The muscle might remember previous testosterone use and regrow faster, even after a long period where the athlete did not take any drugs. In this video, I will make a case for lifetime bans after PED use in athletes. Not saying that we should implement it tomorrow. I will just put forward some data and some studies on why we should at least consider it going forward. Ready for it? Let's dig into it. Hi everyone, I'm Gomar. I'm a senior scientist at ETH Zurich based in Switzerland. And for the last decade or so, I studied how nutrients and exercise make the muscle grow or atrophy. And some of that work has been around muscle memory. So what actually is muscle memory and why is it important for the concept of banning people lifetime from exercise after PED use? So muscle memory is a very interesting concept. It means that the muscles seem to remember previous training or testosterone use and adapt to it more quickly when you then retrain those people again or those muscles again. You always have two ways of conceptualizing muscle memory. First of all, you have neuromuscular muscle memory. So it's a memory because of the long-term adaptations of neural pathways. You never forget how to ride a bike or how to snatch a lightweight. Although sometimes I do forget that, right? So rather thinking about neural mechanisms. But we are gonna talk about a memory because of the biochemistry within the muscle. So changes within the biochemistry within the muscle. And we call this cellular muscle memory, all right? So that will be the focus of this video. And a very beautiful study in 2013 kindly coined this, this idea of cellular muscle memory. It was from Scandinavian group, Egner et al., published in Journal of Physiology in 2013. And what did they do? It was a mouse study. You can see it also here on the slide. When the study is about mice, I also put it here. So always take that with a grain of salt. It's not in humans. But nevertheless, it's a very elegant study. What did they do? They provided testosterone in a way of a pellet that was strapped around the back of the mice for two weeks. Right? And on the left side, you see CSA. This means cross-sectional area, so how big the muscle fiber is. And obviously, after two weeks of these steroids, you see that the muscles or the muscle fibers are bigger. This is the red dashed line. Then they had three weeks of no training. So then the muscle fibers or the muscle size actually went back to baseline compared to a sham pellet, which is a control mice. And then they overloaded one part of the calf muscles. So they didn't really train it, they surgically removed one part so that one part soleus muscle grew really fast. You see that when the muscle was previously subjected to testosterone, it actually grew faster here on the right side, the red dashed line. So this was the first time that people thought, hmm, that's interesting. Previous testosterone use actually accelerated the growth after a period of detraining, which is exactly cellular me muscle memory. And how is this possible or what are actually the mechanisms behind this? Uh, then we have to talk about satellite cells. Maybe you've heard about that or some people talk about satellite cells. Satellite cells is a difficult name for muscle stem cells. And these are very specific cells that can actually regrow muscle after an injury or when you have been working out really fast. So what does it mean? You see here on the left side those green satellite cells, this is a, just a depiction, and when there is a muscle injury or a hypertrophic stimulus, so for example push-ups or some heavy lifting, so these cells proliferate very fast with the intention to heal the injury. And then what happens is the muscle after a while grows, so you see on the right side that the muscle fiber is bigger, but those satellite cells, they actually, and that's the key point here, they fuse with the muscle fiber and they provide their nucleus to the muscle fiber. Because as you might know from biology class, a muscle fiber is a multinucleated cell. It's one of the few cells in the body that has several hundreds of nuclei attached to them in contrast to other cells who only have one nucleus, all right? So that's a key point here. You have an injury, those satellite cells, they proliferate, they fuse, 
and they provide their DNA or at least their nucleus to the muscle fiber to sustain the growth. So this could also be one of the reasons why cellular muscle memory actually occurs at least after testosterone use. Because you see here, it's the same study that I just talked about from the Scandinavians. What happened here is that the myonuclei in the mice that had been using those steroids did not decrease during a period of detraining or no training. Remember, the muscle size actually decreased in those cells. So the muscle size decreased and the amount of nuclei within one fiber actually remained high. So that gave, let's say, the cell more capacity, more DNA to synthesize, to make more proteins, to build when there was a period of regrowth in the second training phase. So that's kind of the idea of the amount of nuclei, how important they are. At least after testosterone use, this has been validated quite well. So this is an overview on how you have to see the cellular mem memory concept. You have first a training period where obviously the muscle sizes increases. You can see this as only training, that's one point, but you can also see this as after testosterone use, obviously only with testosterone also the muscle grows. Then you stop testosterone or you stop training, there is a decrease in muscle fiber size for a certain amount of time. And then when you retrain, you see here the slope of the black line is the highest when the muscle has been trained previously compared to the green line who has not been training before. So that's the ID. And people think, yeah, that's nice, Gomar. This is a mouse study and they gave two weeks of testosterone and then a two week or three week detraining period. That's very short. The authors actually did a similar experiment where they had a detraining period of not two weeks, but 11 weeks. And here they saw exactly the same. On the left side, you see in the regrowth phase that there was a steeper slope in the muscle that has previously been subjected to this testosterone. And also the amount of myonuclei remain higher exactly as in the short-term study. So that's pretty cool. Important, this is quite long. 12 weeks is approximately 12% of a mouse lifespan. So you can think about it as eight to 10 years of a human lifespan. So that's a long detraining period in my opinion. So that's quite cool. There's more data on this. So this is from 2013, this previous study. This study uh, I found is a very new study that did a similar experiment. And it's titled Early Life Androgen Administration, so testosterone or nandrolone administration, attenuates aging-related declines in muscle protein synthesis. So that's quite cool. So first they grew mice until seven months old. So that's a, let's say a juvenile mouse that is young, similar as let's say 20 to 25 years old for a human. And then they gave six weeks or two months of nandrolone. So that's also an anabolic steroid that has been known to grow muscle. And then there are two groups. One group was sacrificed one week after this period of nandrolone administration and another group was sacrificed at 16 months, so a long period of time after the nandrolone administration. Obviously, from month nine, as you can see here, to month 16, there was no uh, nandrolone administration and also no training. So what did they measure? They measured the amount of new proteins that the muscle could synthesize. This is correlated, at least to some extent, to how fast a muscle can grow. Right? And what you can see here, this is the gastrocnemius. FSR means fractional synthetic rate. So how much amount of proteins a muscle can synthesize. And here you can quite beautifully see that in the young mice, so right after, let's say one week after the nandrolone administration, you see an, a strong increase in fractional synthetic rate as you could expect after such an anabolic steroid. But then the interesting part here, at 16 months of age, so seven months, that's a very long time, after nandrolone administration, these mice were still able to synthesize 26% more proteins. So that's, I think, a very interesting case that shows that there's a long-term effect of this nandrolone administration. Again, this is obviously in rodents. So back to our uh, initial paper and what the, what the paper the, the Scandinavians wrote, I think it's quite interesting. They say in the discussion, thus the benefits of even episodic drug abuse might be long lasting, if not permanent in athletes. And then they call the WADA to increase their doping ban or at least the time of their doping ban. That's rodents. I think the data is relatively robust that Testosterone increases the amount of myonuclei 
within a muscle fiber and that provides more capacity to grow when the muscle is again uh, re-stimulated after a period of detraining or no testosterone use. So that's something we know. But what about humans? Obviously those studies are much more difficult to do. One interesting cross-sectional study I found in humans and it's titled Higher My Nuclei Density in Muscle Fibers Persists Among Former Users of Anabolic Androgenic Steroids. So cross-sectional, what does that mean? You just at one point in time, for example in 2022, they take a group of non-users but resistance trained people, all right, so weightlifters. Then they use also a group of current users. So at the moment they're using testosterone or other anabolic agents. And the third group, and obviously that's the interesting group here, has been using anabolic steroids for a period of time, but then at least for four years, they stopped using those drugs. And those three groups, you're gonna analyze on specific parameters I will explain you now. So first of all, let's look at the characteristics of the participants because I think it's very important. And as you can see here, they were around 30 years old. Training characteristics, they did quite some resistance training, so five to, to, to six sessions per week, a lot of uh, session, uh, exercises per session, and there were not really uh, many differences related to training characteristics between the group. And then the point here, history of steroid use. So first of all, the elapsed time since they stopped using the drugs, the first uh, row here, is on average four years for the former AAS users. So that's a quite a long time since they stopped, in my opinion. And then also an interesting parameter here, in my opinion, the accumulated duration of the steroid use. And this was in weeks, put out in weeks, 174 weeks for the current users, and for the former users also quite a long time, 140 weeks, so that's approximately three years. All right, so this is a, an interesting group of people. Again, it's cross-sectional, so no people were actually followed up, it's just a, a section within uh, the timeline. And then lastly, also some data on their physique or how they looked like and what their fat percentage was. For example, they had a, a similar body fat percentage, uh, but just above, above 15. You see the lean mass index, it's a measurement of uh, muscle mass, was higher in the current and the former uh, steroid users compared to the control group who only did resistance training. So the question here is, what is the effect of the steroid use on the muscle currently? So in the people who are using now anabolic steroids, but also after stopping for four years. And here you can see uh, the myonuclear domain within type one and type two muscle fibers. So what the researcher did, they took a muscle, a little piece of the, the, the quadricep. I think they found a, a lot of muscle in those weightlifters, that's for sure. And what they then did, they made a cross-sectional section of all the muscle fibers, or at least the muscle fibers within that muscle biopsy. And then they did some biochemistry and they measured the amount of type one and also the amount of type two fibers and how many nuclei they were within each fiber. And then you can measure the myonuclear domain. And that is basically how much cytosol, so how much muscle fiber there is per my nucleus. You can see here that in the current, as well in the former anabolic steroid users, there is a smaller my nuclear domain compared to control weightlifters. This means that there are more my nuclei per unit of muscle fiber. So you could think that there's more DNA and more potential for muscle protein synthesis and growing muscles. And this is not only in the current, this is something you could expect, but also after four years of using and then stopping the anabolic steroids. So this is a strong case again for showing that there's long-term effect of testosterone or anabolic agent use. The question here is, what do we do with it? We have some good examples in sports from people that have been using testosterone or other anabolic agents. I'm thinking about Ricky Gerard, Justin Gatlin, who had a four-year ban, came back and won multiple uh, world championship medals. What do we do? Do we have a sufficient amount of data to provide a lifetime ban to these athletes or should we give them a second chance? I cannot give you the solution to this problem. I can only provide you a pro and a contra case and you have to decide for yourself given the data that I just showed you. So for the YES camp, you could say there is robust data on the long-term effect of testosterone in rodents. 
There are long-term positive effects on my nuclear domains in humans. So it's not only rodent uh, data, but also human data. But this human data obviously is cross-sectional. There's no follow-up, I will get to that. And you can also be very harsh and without saying anything about the biochemistry, you can just say, you know the rules, there is no second chance. If you take willingly banned substances, you should not be able to compete forever in a certain sports. Harsh take, but obviously a take that you could that you could take. Then you also have the camp of no, you cannot do this lifetime bans. Why? There's only rodent data. The data in humans is cross-sectional. There's no longitudinal data. So what do I mean with that? What you could do, it's more difficult, is you could provide testosterone to a group of people, then let them detrain or at least go away from the testosterone and then see if they could regrow faster. Similar as the rodent studies we just talked about. This has not been done, so we don't have conclusive evidence in humans. And then, obviously, you could also say, everyone, no matter what the data or the biochemistry says, you should always get a second chance. I don't know the answer. You can make up your mind yourself. Good, that was it for today. Hope you liked this type of video. I try to be, let's say, balanced and nuanced. If you did, give us a quick like as well as a subscribe. And if you want to learn more on how CrossFit or at least high intensity exercises can lead to specific muscle growth, then just look at the video popping up right here.